All right. So for passive processes, remember they do not require ATP. Active processes do. Sometimes we refer to active processes as solute pumping. And they're gonna require protein carriers that move substances under certain conditions. So maybe those substances are too big to go through a membrane channel. So also maybe they are not lipid soluble. Remember the inside of the plasma membrane has those phospholipid tails that are nonpolar. All right, so if they're not lipid soluble, they're gonna need some help to get across the membrane. And they may have to move against a concentration gradient. Remember, passive transport movement from area of high concentration to area of low concentration. So it's possible to move substances against their concentration gradients, but it's usually going to require energy or ATP for transport. All right. So again, talking about the solute pumps. You can, these are protein carriers that transport things like ions, sugars, and amino acids. And the ATP, or energy, gives those solute pumps energy. So let's see if we can make that a little bigger for you. Is that a little easier to see on the screen? Okay. So in many cases, substances get moved against their concentration gradient or an electrical gradient. So maybe it's a difference in charge. Classic example of active transport is your sodium potassium pump. So here, sodium gets transported out of the cell. Potassium gets transported inside the cell. Okay, and this is going against concentration gradient, so it requires energy. So there's already a lot of sodium on the outside of the cell. Already potassium on the inside. All right, vesicular transport. Is it basically transport using vesicles? I think we talked briefly about these, but vesicles are basically spheres that have substances in, in the inside. And these substances can get moved without actually crossing through the plasma membrane because the vesicle basically merges with the plasma membrane. It can be through exocytosis or endocytosis. And there's two types of endocytosis. Phagocytosis, which is cell eating something. Penocytosis, which is cell drinking something, getting some fluid. Endo means things go inside the cell. Exo means things go outside the cell. All right, so we just said that. So exocytosis is getting materials out of the cell. So the material is carried in that vesicle. Another term for that is a membranous sac, sac that has a membrane around it. And that vesicle is going to move toward the plasma membrane and actually combine with it. Okay, because the material that makes up the plasma membrane is basically the same type of phospholipid that you have in the cell membrane. And it basically, like we have this circle, it goes toward the membrane and basically comes apart at the membrane, becomes part of the membrane and it empties the material out on the outside of the cell. So with active processes, again, the docking process for exocytosis. So you have membrane proteins that cross the membrane, or proteins that cross the membrane. They're called V snares. The V stands for vesicle. Okay? Don't get too bent out of shape about it. They're just transmembrane proteins. We also have plasma membrane proteins. They're called T snares. They're called T for target. In the V snares, the vesicle, you know, the, the trans the membrane proteins on the vesicle 
will bind to the membrane proteins on the plasma membrane. And they fit together like a corkscrew. And they fuse the membranes together. So that's exocytosis. Let's talk about endocytosis. So here, material is going into the cell. So things that are on the outside of the cell that are extracellular get engulfed by part of that membrane, cell membrane, and it becomes a membranous vesicle. That vesicle is then going to fuse with the lysosome. And the contents of the lysosome get digested, okay, because you have these lysosomal enzymes. Remember, lice means to break or digest. In a few cases, the vesicle actually gets released by exocytosis to the opposite side of the cell. That's in certain cases. Most cases, you just release the chemicals. All right, so what are the different kinds of endocytosis? We talked about this briefly already. Phagocytosis, remember phago means eating. So phagocytosis is cell eating. So the cells engulfing these particles like bacteria or cells in the body that have died. So you have these extensions of your cytoplasm called pseudopods and they can separate substances from the external environment, the environment outside of the cell. And they're basically like little feet. And they'll wrap around things on the outside of the cell that aren't supposed to be there. And they don't close them. Okay, and this is not a process for getting nutrition. Okay, you're no, you have normal body processes for that. This is about protecting your body. You also have pinocytosis or cell drinking. Okay, so in this case, the cell will, in a sense, gulp down droplets of fluid on the outside of the cell. Remember, extracellular fluid means fluid on the outside. It may have dissolved proteins or fats in it. And that plasma membrane is gonna form a pit, essentially, or a dip, a depression. The edges then will fuse around the droplet. This happens routinely in most cells, particularly those that are involved in absorption, like the cells in your small intestine. Okay, that's how they're able to get the nut nutrients to your body cells. Okay. Another type of endocytosis is receptor-mediated endocytosis. And receptor-mediated just means you have receptor proteins on your surface of your plasma membrane. And they're specific to only bind to certain substances. Okay, so this is very selective, allows you to bring in things into your cells like iron, cholesterol, certain hormones, and other enzymes, okay? But th these receptors are specific to those things. There's a, like there's a receptor for iron, a receptor for cholesterol, a receptor for something else. All right. And so what happens is when the target molecule gets engulfed, the receptors and the target molecules are on the, are inside the vesicle, okay? So you have like the receptor out here and it goes around it. So now the receptor and the target molecule are on the inside. All right. So the, the, the contents can either be used if there's something you need or it'll be destroyed if it's something you don't, okay? So we're going to transition from exocytosis and endocytosis to the cell cycle. Another big cellular process. 
So it's, it's a set of changes that your cell goes through from the time that it's formed until the time it goes through cellular division. Two main parts of cell life cycle. You have interphase and cell division. So in interphase, your cell is just growing, going through its normal processes, normal chemical reactions. It's the overwhelmingly long piece of the cell cycle. Then you get to cell division. Cell replicates itself. So you get a copy, basically you end up with two new cells. And why do we do this? So we can have more cells so you can grow and repair your, your tissues. Okay, as you damage cells, you need new cells to replenish them. All right, so I'm gonna stop there for a minute and let you all talk to a partner and explain the cell cycle to each other. So I'll give you all a minute to do that now. And if you're watching at home, go ahead and do this while you're watching at home. All right, let's talk about DNA replication. Okay, it's important for cell division. So your genetic material gets duplicated, helps the cell prepare to divide into two new cells. And this is going to happen at the end of interphase, or toward the end of interphase. Okay, so it needs to happen before you go into cell division. You got to copy your DNA first. So your DNA in replication is going to uncoil. Remember, your DNA exists as a double helix. Remember that? Two strands. So it's going to uncoil so you get two strands of nucleotides, or two chains. So in each side, it's going to serve as a template. And the nucleotides here are going to be complementary on the two strands. So adenine is always going to bond with thymine on the other strand. Guanine is always going to bond with cytosine on the other strand. So I'll give you an example here. If you have a nucleotide sequence on one chain, it says TAC, TGC, it will bind with the complementary sequence ATG, ACG, okay? Based on those base pairing rules. All right, so the events that happen in cell division. So in the cell division phase, you have mitosis, which means you're dividing the nucleus. So you end up with formation of two daughter nuclei. So you go from one nucleus to two nucle nuclei. Then you have cytokinesis, which means dividing your cytoplasm. Okay, cyto for cytoplasm. Okay, so cytokinesis happens toward the end of mitosis. And you end up with two new daughter cells. So in cell division, you start with one cell, you make two. Okay. So if you have at whatever number of cells you have at the beginning of one round of mitosis, <clears throat> at the end of that phase, you'll have twice as many. Let's talk about the stages of mitosis. First stage is prophase. And it's the first part, as we said. Then you start seeing chromatin, start coiling into chromosomes. Remember, the chromatin is how the DNA exists normally, okay, in the, in the nucleus. And the chromosomes are held together. So basically, chromosomes are kind of like a little X, okay? So, and they're held together in the middle by a central mirror. And each chromosome has two strands. Each of those strands is called a chromatid. So the two chromatids are held together by that central mirror. So basically they separate, become kind of like a less than and a greater than sign.
Okay, so continuing on in prophase, your centrioles. Okay, they're gonna start moving toward the sides or poles of the cell. So they're gonna direct the assembly or uh, production of these mitotic spindle fibers. So what are those spindle fibers? Well, they're made up of microtubules. And what are they used for? They basically provide a scaffold or some sort of structure so the chromosomes can attach and move. So if you think about them like the strings on a puppet. So you have like the puppeteer holding strings at the top and then the puppet does what it does. So that's basically what the centrioles do to the chromosomes. All right. Uh, in prophase, you'll also see the nuclear envelope breaking down. So interphase, you should see a distinct nuclear envelope inside the cell. But in prophase, you start seeing that going away. Then we get to metaphase. So you've got chromosomes, but now the chromosomes are going to be moved to the middle of the cell or the center, what we call the metaphase plate. So the metaphase plate is basically middle of the cell, they form a line, center of the spindle, and it's basically in between the centrioles of the different sides of the cell. And you'll see a straight line of chromosomes, single file. Next phase of mitosis is anaphase. And here the centromere splits and the sister chromatids go opposite directions, move toward opposite sides of the cell. So how do you know when anaphase is over? You know when the chromosomes stop moving. Then we get to telophase, which is basically a reverse of what happens in prophase. So then your chromosomes start uncoiling and start forming chromatin again. Okay, then your spindles start coming apart and disappearing. Your nuclear envelope starts coming back. Okay, reforms around the chromatin. Then you start seeing the nucleoli. Remember those, are, that's where the ribosomal RNA is made. And it's inside each of those daughter nuclei. Okay, we still need to divide our cell. We basically replicated our nuclei. Now we need to replicate our cells. So we got to divide the cytoplasm up and the organelles. You'll see this start happening during late anaphase and completes during telophase. Characteristic of cytokinesis is the cleavage furrow. It starts pinching the cells apart. And it's actually made of a ring of microfilaments. Okay, so what's the big picture here? Big picture, you start with one cell, the four cell division, you end up with two cells at the end of cell division. Okay, also, mitosis and cytokinesis aren't really separate processes, they happen together. So dividing the nuclei are replicating the nuclei and replicating or dividing up the cells happens at the same time. So you get a few cases where your cytoplasm doesn't get divided. And you end up with cells with multiple nuclei in them. Where do we see this? Well, we see this in liver cells. Okay, now mitosis, 90% of the time, this is how it works. All right, so when mitosis, you know, goes badly and starts reproducing uncontrollably, that's when we get tumors and cancer, okay? All right, so protein synthesis. So we talked about mitosis, it's going, well, Let's take a pause 
explain the phases of mitosis to each other. All right, protein synthesis. So protein synthesis, you have to start with our DNA, right? And that's your, your blueprint, helps you make your proteins. So we talk about genes, right? So what are genes? They're just pieces of your DNA that carry some piece of your blueprint. Help you build one protein. Another term for that is a polypeptide chain. So what are the function of proteins? So if they're fibrous or structural, they help as building materials in your cells. If they're functional or globular, they serve as biological catalysts or enzymes. So they help you with chemical reactions. So either they're for structure or for chemical reactions. Okay, DNA, your genetic code, is also known as a triplet code. And what are the triplets? Well, these are three nitrogenous bases, okay? Your A's, your C's, your G's, and your T's. So some set of three, or combination of three. And each one, each, basically there's gonna be a set of three that will code for a specific amino acid. So if you see AAA or adenine, 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 that codes for phenylalanine. That it codes for that amino acid. So most ribosomes, are you gonna find them in the cytoplasm? After they leave the nuclear pore, after they're made, they're going to be floating in the cytoplasm. So even though DNA does all these things and directs all these processes in your cell, it never leaves your cell or never leaves your nucleus. And it always stays in the nucleus, even though it's in control of everything. Okay. So excuse my Again, silly reference, but DNA is kind of like the Wizard of Oz that's behind the curtain, right? So all these, all these people are doing all these things because the Wizard of Oz told them to. But Wizard of Oz, and then nobody's ever seen the wizard, right? So it's kind of like that. So, or if you've seen the Wiz and they're saying today the color's green and tomorrow the color's red, you know, DNA is making all these choices, but no, nobody ever gets to meet the wizard, so. All right, um, so DNA needs some sort of system to decode the information, right? It needs some sort of messenger because it can't leave the cell. It can't leave the nucleus. So if, if the ribosomes are outside the nucleus and the DNA is inside the nucleus, How's the DNA going to get to make protein? Okay, it's got to create a, a, a messenger to take its message for it. Okay, so how does it do that? It makes RNA. Okay, and RNA, remember, stands for ribonucleic acid. How is RNA different from DNA? Well, remember this from chapter two. RNA has one strand, DNA has two strands. RNA sugar is ribose, right? For ribonucleic acid, DNA sugar is deoxyribose. In terms of the nitrogenous bases, DNA has thymine, RNA has uracil, okay? So DNA has A, C, G, and T, RNA has A, C, G, and U. So, and there's different kinds of RNA. So one kind of RNA is transfer RNA, also known as tRNA. So tRNA is gonna transfer, as the name suggests, the right amino acid to the ribosome. 
Okay, we'll get into that. But basically, it reads the sequence, says, oh, you need this amino acid. So it brings that one specifically. We also have ribosomal RNA. And it's a big component of the ribosomes where the proteins get made. Remember, that's what's made of the nucleoli. Okay. All right. Finally, last but not least, we have the messenger RNA. Okay, and that's that carrier of all those instructions from the DNA to make the proteins. So it brings the instructions from the nucleus to the ribosome. All right, so what are the phases of protein synthesis? Well, there's two big phases with, with several steps each. First phase is transcription. Second phase is translation. All right, so I'll, before I get into all the detail, I just want to give you an overview. So what we call like the central dogma of biology is DNA to RNA to protein, okay? Now, DNA doesn't become RNA. DNA is used to make RNA. RNA is used to make protein. All right, so say it with me. DNA is used to make RNA. RNA is used to make protein. So now we're going to add a little bit to it. In transcription, DNA is used to make RNA. In transcription, DNA is used to make RNA. All right, in translation, RNA is used to make protein. Okay, so if you can write those two sentences down real quick, that will help you as we go through this whole thing with all the details, okay? But if you, want, if you can get that piece in your head, then you can plug in all the details, okay? Yes. <laughs> So yeah, if you can get this, that'll help you a lot on your test. All right, so in transcription, you're taking the information from the sequence of DNA, making a complementary messenger RNA sequence. Well, it's, it's, in, the, it's in the outline. And, and I'll make, I'll add just a little wrinkle. I'll put M there. So making messenger RNA. So DNA is used to make, him, to make messenger RNA. Yes. Yes. Now here's, so in translation, which we haven't covered yet, you're actually going to use all three. So, so, so I'm just going to put that there, just, or you can do it like this. Trans, a transfer, messenger, and ribosomal, they all work together. T for transfer, okay. M for messenger, R for ribosomal. So all three are going to get used in translation. So 
because I guess for, I'm more of a big picture person and then you kind of, I don't know, I, I do like bubble charts and draw and have an outline and then I add details. So, because I mean, to me, it's a lot of information if you just like, oh, I'm just going to try to remember all this information. So, transfer. All right, so in transcription, you, you just have your DNA and your messenger RNA. Okay, again, your triplets, that's your three base sequence, it specifies your specific amino acid in your DNA. Now, another term you need to know is a codon. Codon has something to do with the word code, right? Genetic code. These are the corresponding three base sequences in the mRNA. So if we're talking about the DNA, we'll use the word triplet. If we're talking about RNA, we're going to use the term codon. I know. <laughs> Triplets are for DNA. Codons are for RNA. Yes. Did I hear a question? Okay. All right. So here's an example. Here's your DNA triplets. You have the sequence AAT, CGT, TGC, and M. Can y'all see that down there at the bottom? Now we'll move it up. So in DNA, A is complementary to T, but in mRNA, there's no T, there's U. Okay. So A is complementary to U, so it would be UUA, then GCA, AGC. Okay, and if that's not making sense yet, just you gotta kind of go over it in your head. A base pairs with T in DNA, A base pairs with U and RNA. You just kind of have to keep practicing it. Okay. The best thing I can suggest to you. Make make your own three three make your own triplet set of DNA, and just figure out what are the mRNA sequence that goes with it or the DNA sequence. Yes. So, so If we were talking about making a, if we were replicating the DNA instead, if we were if we were replicating and making DNA, it would be TTA. So because we're making RNA, there's no T. So it has to be UUA. <laughs> yes. That's, that's what it's all about right there, light bulb. That's, that's, We're, do, we're transcribing. We're not replicating. We're <laughs> replicating is DNA to DNA. Transcribing is DNA to RNA. Uracil. There you go. All right, so that's transcription. We just made some messenger RNA. All right, now we're going to take that messenger RNA and make some protein. That's translation. So here we take our mRNA sequence, translate it. So in a sense, transcribing is writing down what somebody said, right? Like when you take it, if you do medical transcription, right? So even though you're doing DNA to RNA, it's still the nucleic acid language, right? Translating is going to another language, right? Like English to Spanish or whatever. So um, here we're going from the nucleic acid language to the protein language, okay? So it's a, it's a whole different sequence, right? So 
you're not going to have A, C, G, and T anymore. Now you have amino acids. Okay, that's why it's translating. All right, so amino acids, remember, those are your building blocks to your proteins. Those are your monomers. Your proteins are your polymers. Okay, translation, what are your steps? Messenger is used to make protein. That's the overall for translation. Now let's talk about the steps of translation. All right, so messenger RNA, remember we just made it in transcription, right? It's gonna leave the nucleus, go through a nuclear pore, attach itself to a ribosome. Why? Because that's where the magic happens, right? That's where the proteins get made, okay? So, that's where translation begins. Now, remember I said, you're gonna have all three RNAs involved. Now, some new trans transfer RNA, tRNA is gonna recognize part of your messenger RNA sequence. Okay, it's gonna see three nucleotides and say, I got the perfect amino acid for you, right? So that's what they're gonna say. They're gonna say, oh, AAA, I got phenylalanine for you. All right, if they see something else, they'll bring another one. So, so how this works is that the tRNA brings the amino acid, mRNA, remember we said triplets are for DNA, codons are for RNA. So the mRNA has a codon. The tRNA has an anti-codon that's complementary. Okay, so they, they connect to each other and bind. Yes, so we're in translation time. So we're, we're dealing with the RNAs and the amino acids. Okay, so, so if you have your mRNA sequence, and I'm, I'm just gonna put, these are just your different codons, okay? So these are, so you can have your tRNA, you have some anti-codons. They're gonna come by, okay? Because they recognize the complementary sequence, okay? Because this is still RNA. So this sequence, part of the tRNA is complementary to this codon and the mRNA. Now, but each tRNA brings an amino acid with it. So this one has one and this one has one. And these two amino acids would really prefer to be attached to each other. So, so they, how do the amino acids and the anti-codon tie into each other? So essentially they tie into each other because they have essentially polar covalent bonds that attach each other. But remember, those are breakable. Okay? So you're going to get a peptide bond between these two amino acids. This bond is gonna break. That transfer RNA is gonna leave, okay? So, cause its job was to bring over amino acids. Once it's brought its amino acid, it's attached to the sequence, it's done. Okay, so it's, I'm out, all right? So another way of thinking about it is, you know, I have my daughter, I dropped my daughter off at school. She was in the door, I'm out, right? She's good, okay? I'm not gonna sit there in the parking lot until 3.30, right? So I can go off, get another amino acid, okay? All right, so 
like I said, and the other pieces I did not draw on here because I just didn't want to overcomplicate it. Kind of in the background here, you got this big sandwich. Yeah, I know, right? It's about that time, right? So this is your ribosomal RNA. I know, right? So you have your ribosomal RNA, you have your mRNA sequence, which is your mRNA, and you got your tRNAs bringing amino acids. So that's how they're all involved. Okay. Um, yeah. Do you have to break this down real quick? Please do. I got, I got to dumb it down. No, you got you no, you no, got to no, break no, it down. No, you didn't dumb it down. So, okay. So going back to what you said about dropping your daughter, so you yeah. are technically the AA, right? The amino acid. Well, I, in that in that I'm the tRNA. The parent is the amino. The parent's the tRNA. The kid's the amino acid. Okay. So, what's the school? Is it school? School's the ribosomal RNA. Boom. <laughs> Kids hold hands, go in the class. That's, that's a peptide bond. That's polypeptide. All right. You get it though, right? You, it makes more sense now, right? Kind of. Like it's kind of tied into each other. So, again, you got all three working together. I know it's a lot. You kind of have to read over it, look over it. Uh, I got the videos posted. I, I'll have this one posted later today. Um, I have a lot of videos in Canvas for you to watch. Uh, I know there's a lot of them, but a lot of them are like animations and stuff like that. And so, because I mean, I wish I could draw all that stuff and make it real cool, but I put the videos on there. So if, if listen to me talk doesn't do it for you, doesn't hurt my feelings. Okay, you're not hurting my feelings. My only my concern is you get it. So you if you're watching somebody on YouTube and you get it, as long as you get a good grade on the test, we're good. We're good. So it's just in here, it's a lot of material to try to cover in an hour. You know, and I'm trying to cut get through and get you as much as I can get you. Um, but and I could come in here and I could just show you the videos, but I mean theoretically. As long as you got an internet connection, you can watch the videos. My preference would be you watch the videos, come to class, ask me questions like, I didn't get this in the video. Okay. Um, but, you know, because my thing is, if it was just me showing videos, then I'd be like, well, why even bother to show up? Because you could watch the video at home. So, all right. So, that's basically translation in a nutshell. Um, I know it's a lot, but I'm going to ask you to at least explain what you do know. You don't have to know it all. Explain to your partner transcription and translation real quick. All right, so let's talk about body tissues. Remember, moving up levels of organization. Groups of cells with similar structure, similar function. Four big types. Remember, these are big categories we went over in lab. Epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, nervous tissue, right? All right, so your locations of epithelial tissue. Start there. Bottom covering your body, lining the inside of your body, and on the glands, okay? That's where you'll find epithelial tissue. What's the function of epithelial tissue? Helps protect your body. You can absorb things like in your small intestines, right? You can be a filter like in your kidneys. You can secrete different substances, okay? Hormones, things like that. More characteristics of epithelium. You get sheets because the cells fit so closely together. You have two surfaces. You have a upper, well, I shouldn't say upper because it's not always upper. And the skin is the upper, but you have a free surface, which is apical. Okay, and then you have a lower surface that rests on a basement membrane. So like, this is our apical surface of our skin, right? Underneath it, you're gonna have an attachment to a basal basement membrane. Okay, so that, your skin just doesn't fall off. 
has to attach somewhere, right? Typically, your epithelium is avascular. A means without. So it doesn't typically have its own blood supply. Okay, the cells underneath do. And epithelium regenerates as long as it gets some sort of nourishment. Okay, how do we classify epithelium? by the number of layers. Remember in the lab, one layer is simple, multiple layers stratified, right? Also by shape, they're flat. It's squamous. If it's like dice, it's cuboidal. And if it's more rectangular, it's column-like, it's columnar. Remember we learned this in lab, that it's simple squamous. Single layer with flat cells form some sort of membrane typically. I see this in the respiratory system lining the air sacs in your lungs. In the cardiovascular system, you see it forming walls in your capillaries. It can also form what we call serose or serous membranes, and they can line and cover your organs. All right, in these membranes, you have functions like filtration, diffusion, secretion. Okay, so these are things you've already learned. You're just looking at, thinking about it in the, in the tissue context. Okay. Simple cuboidal. Simple, single layer, cuboidal, cube like cells. We'll see them in glands and ducts. In the walls of kidney tubules, surface of your ovaries and females, uh, and functions for absorption as well as secretion. So in the event they have cilia, they can move mucus. You also see these sometimes in reproductive cells. And also have simple columnar epithelium, one layer, tall cells. Goblet cells are an example, and they secrete mucus. You see these in your digestive tract. Okay, mucous membranes, again, the line of your body cavity. So we learned about serous membranes already. Now we're adding mucous membranes or mucosae. Again, also functioning in absorption and secretion. You also have the pseudostratified columnar epithelium. So it's generally a single layer, but some cells are shorter than others, so it makes it look like sometimes you have two layers. See these often in the respiratory uh, tract. A respiratory system. They have cilia, we call them pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, right? Probably saw that in lab. And like many of these other cells, functioning for secretion and absorption. Let's talk about the stratified epithelium. All right, so stratified cuboidal, multiple layers, cuboidal cells involved in protection in your body. Okay, stratified columnar epithelium. The cells on the surface are columnar, but the cells underneath could be different shapes and different sizes. In some cases in your body, you'll also find stratified cuboidal or stratified columnar epithelium, like in the ducts and the large glands. So, I think you learned in lab, we see in the urinary bladder, transitional epithelium allows for stretching 
Okay, it's kind of a modified stratified squamous epithelium. They can stretch and then go back to their normal shape. Okay, you also have glands that are epithelial cells. Okay, the glands do what? They secrete things. So the secretions have proteins in them and they are dissolved in water. Secretion is active, okay? Sometimes it's gonna require some energy to make it happen. Glands can be endocrine, All right, or exocrine. For the endocrine glands, they have no ducts. The secretions go directly into the blood vessels. So all your secretions are gonna be hormones. So if you've heard of any of these organs, like your adrenal glands, your thyroid gland, pituitary gland, these are all endocrine ductless glands. Okay, for the exocrine glands, again, these secretions go into ducts, and they, then they go to the surface of the epithelium. So things like your sweat glands, your oil glands, your liver and your pancreas, okay, those all have ducts. And they can be both internal and external glands. Okay, so that's epithelial tissue. Let's move on to connective. And again, you know, I'll try to get through as much of this as I can, but the reality is you do get this in, in lab as well. Uh, so it was really the first part that I really wanted you to get through in the cells part. Okay, connective tissue, you'll see it all over your body, right? Lots of different places. It's the most abundant tissue, most widely distributed. Obviously it helps you with protection, protects your body, supports your body, connects tissues, right? Binds them together as the name suggests. So what are some characteristics? You have some tissues that are, have great blood supply, others not so much. You have an extracellular matrix, surrounds the living cells, but that extracellular matrix itself is considered non-living. Okay. So in the extracellular matrix, you have what we call fibers and ground substance. So the ground substance, mostly water, got some proteins that are sticky, adhesion proteins, connect, they connect things, as well as some sugars, polysaccharides. Fibers are made by connective tissue cells. They could be, those fibers could be collagen, could be elastic or reticular. So you, I think we did get a chance for you to see all three types. If you look at your study guides for lab, you should see these. All right, so if you go from most rigid to most soft or most fluid, bone is your most rigid, followed by cartilage. Then you got your dense connective tissue, then your loose connective tissue, and then your blood. Yes, blood, even though it's a fluid, is a connective tissue. All right, so bone or osseous tissue it's made up of bone cells, also known as osteocytes. Osteocytes, they live in these cavities called lacunae. Bone is a hard matrix, right? You don't want bones to be soft. It's made up of what we call calcium salts. Okay, remember calcium is good for strong bones, right? You probably heard that. You have large numbers of collagen fibers in your bone. Provide support and protection. Your cartilage is not as hard as bone, but more flexible, right? You can bend your ears, bend your nose a little bit. All right, uh, it's only found certain places in your body. So just like the main cell type in bone is an osteocyte, the main, uh, main cell type in cartilage is a chondrocyte. All right, so the 
Connective tissue types, again, let's move on from bone to hyaline cartilage. That's your kind of bread and butter, most widespread type of cartilage, okay? And I know this isn't necessarily as exciting as learning about, you know, cell processes and mitosis and all that, uh, but it is still important. All right. Um, made up of collagen as a rubbery matrix. Okay, where do you find it? In the plates of your bones, we call this those epiphyseal plates. You'll see them in certain parts of the fetal skeleton before birth, in the larynx and the throat. As, as we know about cartilage, it's more flexible than bone. Okay, elastic cartilage, as the name suggests, it's, it's stretchy. Okay, it can go back to its original shape. You see it in the external ear, provides support. So if you move it, it will go back to where it was before. You also have fibro cartilage. You see it in the spinal column, forms your vertebral disc and your inner vertebral disc. Right, you want those cushion like this in there between your vertebrae. The dense connective tissue or dense fibrous tissue. Made up of collagen for the most part. The cell type that makes the fibers are fibroblasts, right? Blast cells typically make stuff, okay? So the fibroblasts make fiber. So where do you see dense connective tissue or dense fibrous tissue? See it in tendons and ligaments as well as your dermis okay, underneath your epidermis. And remember the tendons attach muscle to bone, ligaments attach bone to bone at your joints. And they are more elastic, more stretchy than tendons. Okay, you also have loose connective tissue. So there we've got your areolar tissue, your adipose tissue, and your reticular tissue. So it's the areolar tissue looks like cobwebs. It's very widely distributed in your body. Forms a glue, sticks your body together. Yes, ma'am. On the areolar? Yes. You got a lot of air. Okay, very good. Yep, good. All right. I have a layer of that aerial tissue. It's called lamina propria. It's a lining, lines all your membranes. Medical application your aerial tissue can soak up fluid leads to edema. So if you ever worked in a nursing home or somewhere you've seen people with their feet or their uh, ankles that are swollen. Yeah. Hmm? Yes. So that's edema. All right. The adipose tissue. So has fat globules in it. Okay, the nucleus is on the side of the cell. Provides insulation, protection, fuel storage, or energy storage. Uh, those of us who have, you know, a little more fat than others, right? I got a little more than others. Uh, have definitely have adipose tissue, but we all have some. And our reticular connective tissue is a delicate network. You have your fibers that are woven together with what we call reticular cells. Forms what we call stroma in your organs, like in your bone marrow, your spleen, your lymph nodes. You got the blood, our fluid connective tissue. All right, so blood Surrounded by fluid matrix, that's your blood plasma. And it's your transport vehicle in your cardiovascular system. It carries your gases, waste, and nutrients. 
Okay, so that's connective tissue. If the muscle tissue contracts, shortens, produces movement, and that's skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle, right? We learned about that in lab. So your skeletal muscle is voluntary, attached to your skeleton, striated, multiple nuclei. Cardiac muscle is involuntary, in the heart only. Pumps blood, has striations, but is, has only one nucleus per cell. Also has these intercalated discs with the gap junctions that connect the cells together. Your smooth muscle, involuntary, what in the walls of hollow organs. Okay, you have this thing called peristalsis, moves your food or blood in a wave-like activity. No striations, and you has one nuclei per cell. All right, so your nervous tissue, you got your neurons, receives and conducts impulses to and from the body. You have support cells called neuroglia, protect and support and insulate the neurons. Okay. So this finishes up with wound healing and tissue repair. Main thing I want you to know here, you know, cells can sometimes regenerate. Depends on how, what tissue it is, how severe it is. Steps, you have inflammation, okay? You have granulation tissue forming. You have regeneration of the surface epithelium. Okay, your scab detaches. All right. Here's some set, uh, developmental aspects of cells and tissues. Okay, so that's chapter three, cells and tissues. So make sure you spend time studying that. And good luck on exam one.